school supervisor for the Latin uh, of students from, uh, from here, that is now in, in North, uh, in, uh, North University, where the MIT is today now. Originally, I'll, I'll introduce a new kind of app to, to I'm, my I'm going to present my Faka Papa in New okay. Zealand. They have a Faka Papa, which I'll give to okay. you. <laughs> so as, as you will see, he has been traveling uh, a lot. He is, uh, he is, uh, his origin is Irish. He works uh, in uh, several uh, places in Canada and in the UK. And after that, he has been moved around, ending in uh, um, Niwa. That was, uh, OK, yeah, you have it. <laughs> Thanks very much. <coughs> um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, I was 16 years in New Zealand, and one of the lovely things the Maori do is uh, when they meet anybody for the first time, they tell you where they're from. And I don't know why we don't do this in Europe, because we're always wondering, where are they from? <laughs> so Martha's already introduced to it. See, I used, at one time I was very cute, but that is <laughs> no longer, yeah. And uh, I studied in Ireland and postdocs and Scotland and England, and then I went to Nova Scotia, where I almost met Martha, but I don't think we actually met in person there, even though we had a paper that turned out to be very highly cited, kind of by accident, but uh, yeah. And then we moved to New Zealand, Uda, and uh, my wife being Canadian, but uh, our position there was short term, and we reared our kids in New Zealand, and now we've come back to Europe. Um, and so the, most of the work that I have here is uh, a lot of it has spun off from some of my students' work. So one of the great things about being a professor is you just criticize other people all the time and you get your students to do all the work. So uh, well, well known fact. <coughs> so I also have good news. Uh, does anybody here use species names in their research? Do you use a species name? You don't use species name? Okay, I have very good news for you coming up soon. Very good news. You're going to heaven. That's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'll talk a bit about how many species exist, um, and then species richness patterns with latitude, because right from the, I remember in fourth year in my degree in Galway, one of uh, the professors talked about the theory of island biogeography, and I thought, this is amazing. You can actually put numbers to these amazing patterns. So I was always fascinated then by biogeography. And having gone back to New Zealand to an academic position, I, I started focusing on biogeography and now, of course, it's become very topical because of climate change. Um, and then uh, the latest paper we've had uh, is accepted about 20 degrees. I'll talk to you about that because I think it's one of the most uh, interesting generalizations about the role of temperature and its effect on life on Earth. Um, so a few years ago, there was another f a famous guy named Alan Longhurst from DFO. Or maybe Martha knew him. Um, and... Um, he, he believed that biogeographers didn't, were really hopeless and we weren't really good scientists. So I'm, I'm hoping we can prove him wrong. Um, and this is what I was told when I was in university. So maybe some of you still believe these things. Um, that most species are microscopic, marine, that are in the deep sea. And that taxonomic effort was decreasing. People still say this, despite the evidence. Um, and zoo and the, the oceans didn't have any biogeographic boundaries. Um, so geographic regions were only on land. And that marine species richness peaked at the equator. So I'll come back to these at the end. But uh, during the census of marine life, which is how I met Martha first, Philippe Boucher published a paper, and this is one of these uh, 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 images from the paper. But uh, we were kind of surprised. The census of marine life is about discovery in the oceans, and the media loved it when we found new species. They didn't care about all this high technology and ROVs and this kind of economic importance. The public wanted scientists just to name species and discover species because after all, that's what the fundamental role of a scientist is to discover things. They don't have to be immediately important. Um, but even better, um, it's the only thing God asked man to do. Um, so in the Bible, God asked man to name species. And in the Holy Quran as well, God asked man to name species. And a thousand years later, in the Sikh Holy Scriptures, they came up and, they knew, they, and God told us how many species were. He said there was 8,400,000. So um, science actually hasn't uh, uh, got any closer to agreement on what the actual number of species is. So maybe we, the Sikh Holy Scriptures were correct. 
But in a way, naming a species is the first step in discovery, and it's recognizing something exists. So really what they're saying is that man should go out and learn stuff. So all of you people who have used species names, you're doing the work of God, and you're going to heaven. So that's my good news for this <laughs> happy holiday weekend. Um, OK, but there's some amazing estimates out there. So you really wonder what people mean by species. And in most of the estimates, they don't say what they mean by species. Um, these studies are using uh, predicting trillions of microbial species. They're talking about genetic diversity and applying species to some genetic concept, which even at that isn't very clear what it is. Um, but if these were true, then the fact that one million species are, the thousand species have gone extinct is, is trivial. So this, they don't seem to compare the, the implications of what they're saying with, with the real world uh, in terms of conservation. So the databases I've used here in this talk, one is the World Register of Marine Species. Um, and then for the non-marine species, I use the Catalogue of Life, which is more or less complete. It's got about 2.2 million species on it, uh, all of which are expert uh, validated. Um, um, but it's not so well known. I'm not sure why. Maybe they don't have a good API, which is one reason, um, to download their, their data. <clears throat> and for marine species distribution data, I use the Ocean Biodiversity Information System. So when we name a species, we have lots of useful information. We have the genus, tells us how it's classified, who its relatives are, and we know the authors, and we know the year published. Um, but, and when we look at different species, like these uh, two fish here, they look completely different, and Linnaeus described them under two different names in the same book. Um, but he didn't know that one was male and one was female. In fact, they're both male and female during their lives. They change their sex. As, you know, fish are very clever, and they like to have the best of both worlds. They don't, uh, not like us. Um, <clears throat> but actually, this, this misnaming also gets worse. So Linnaeus described the, the sperm whale, which most children would recognize a sperm whale from books and cartoons. Um, he described it three times, and his colleagues in the field at the time gave 19 different names to the sperm whale. And if you think that's bad, um, this, uh, the northern, uh, the humpback whale in the northwest Atlantic has got 84 common names. Maybe that's not surprising, but shows how important it was to different uh, societies. But it's got, I think, 40 something, 46 scientific names. So we never knew when we created the World Register Marine Species just what a mess the nomenclature was. So people are already overestimating greatly how many species existed. And in fact, the number of species growing, even though there's about 2,000 new species, marine species described every year, the database is not growing that fast because we keep tidying up all the, the nomenclature mistakes and reducing them. In fact, one of the media releases went really wrong from the World Register of Marine Species when the, some of the, the media said, oh, we're actually losing species faster than something else because they thought they were losing species, but they were only losing species names. So if we look at the, from the time of Linnaeus in 1750 up to nearly the present, um, the number of synonyms here is in the yellow triangle. So it looks like we're, we're, you know, we're not creating as many synonyms, and these are the valid names in circles. But it takes years to tidy up synonyms. It's really boring work. Because uh, you have to go through the literature, you might have to check museum specimens. So there's probably still thousands, if not tens of thousands, of names that are in the database that really nobody uses anymore and are probably synonymous with others. Um, and if we look at uh, the rate of discovery, this is the same kind of graph again. So blue is marine and green is land. And marine is on the right axis and land on the, the left. We can see the number of species described per year. We see this big peak of discovery about 100 years ago. Uh, we see the effects of the world wars. And it's interesting that the terrestrial species rate of discovery really hasn't increased that much this century, which people don't talk about that much. So how could that be? Um, is that because there's less people working in terrestrial? But it's not the case. There's many more. And marine has had its real um, golden age of discovery in the last few decades. And it's, it's still increasing. It's around 2,000 species per year in the last few years. Um, but we never thought of looking at the authors, and then we did look at the authors, and I thought, there must be a mistake. How come we have so many more authors now than ever before, both in the marine and in the non-marine? And even if we take out, we only use first authors on a species name, because sometimes the species is described by two or three people or more, and you still have this big increase. 
So this made us, me um, scratch my head and think, well, if we're increasing effort, then how come we're not increasing the numbers of species being described even more? So you could divide one by the other. And also this authorship is highly correlated with numbers of publications. And we know where the authors are. They're increasing especially in Asia and South America. Uh, but also they're increasing all over the world, actually, in all continents. So the, the, this, this uh, call that the best taxonomists are retiring in is kind of true, but there's lots of younger taxonomists coming in that people don't know about. Um, and actually, it warns the average age of uh, taxonomists, taxonomic editors in the World Register of Marine Species is around early 40s somewhere. So it's not true that they're, they're all retiring. Of course, the best known people uh, maybe are retiring. And if you, divide, if you use a fisheries analogy and divide the number of species per number of authors, we're actually getting these decreasing trends, both for marine and terrestrial. And terrestrial since around 1911, when we saw that big peak in discovery. So at least in terms of what taxonomists have been calling a species, it looks like we've discovered more species, and we're actually more than halfway there. This is the range of estimates of how many marine species might exist, including the undescribed, from about 0.3, which is a paper I published with Simon Wilson, and, um, and then more than 10,000. But these very high numbers are usually based on ratios. And the problem with ratios is that 1 to 2 and 1 to 3 and 1 to 4 is not a simple linear change. You, you're getting a very rapid change. Um, so most of these ratios were also based on various assumptions, like the proportion of taxa is the same all over the world which we know is not true. Um, you just compare you know, marsupials in Australia or uh, mammals in New Zealand. There's only two native mammals, which are bats. So you can't compare taxa in different, different regions. Um, or taking local samples of Australia or from the deep sea and extrapolating to the world. Because you can always go to some location and find very high local richness. Well, why not go to an area with very low local richness and predict that to the world? Well, that wouldn't be so exciting. Um, but this middle paper here looked at all three, uh, several rates. And this was by uh, 117 editors of the World Register of Marine Species. And the supplementary material is the most interesting of any paper I've ever read, because that's in the supplementary material, each expert uh, explained their reasoning as to why they thought, how, how well they were progressing in their field, and how many more species existed. Um, but we used three methods. We actually reviewed published papers that said how many species they could not name in their samples. We used a statistical model designed for looking at uh, rates of, of um, discovery in species names, which includes uh, good confidence limits, and uh, expert opinion. And all three of these ranged around one third, some of the expert opinions to higher. So people think, oh, well, experts never agree. But actually, they do. So here we have, these are the taxa where the experts it's not all of them. Not all the experts came up with a number. So red is the expert opinion. Um, blue are the numbers of named species. And yellow are the model predictions. So you can see the model predictions are rightly always more than the number of named species. It has to be. Um, but shortly after this paper was published, a year later, the nematodes and the comiston experts actually revised their estimates downwards. Um, so actually, there's reasonably good agreement amongst taxonomists about how many more species remain to be described. And if we start looking through the literature, we find that, you know, this is the numbers of known species. So many of these studies are saying three quarters are known. And it's, it's quite odd because some of these authors disagree with my estimates, even though my estimates agree with theirs. They find that a paradox, which I think is kind of funny. Um, because uh, because our global estimates got people's eye and said, oh, it must be 10 million. How could you, you know, predict three, you know, 0.3 million marine species? You must be wrong. But actually, their local group matches ours very, very well. And there's been lots of these studies. And if we look across all environments, I've got 28 papers now in different groups. And this is the number of species named. Um, for all birds, they reckon it's pretty close to 100%. Um, um, birds of Australia. And you can break it down a bit more. There's no trend over time. This is years and percent name per year of publication. Um, so they all more or less agree that we know at least half of all species and probably two thirds, if not more. Another way of looking at the number of species per year is that correlated with the numbers already known, in which case our sample of species on Earth is a good one. 
and it seems to be. So we can take the number of described species per taxon, this is for all species on Earth, and the number described in 2009, for example. And even if we remove the insects, which make up nearly a million, and the plants, we still get a very high correlation. So I think we have a representative sample good enough to do some good biogeography. Um, but what about the microscopic things? Well, if we look at numbers of microscopic species, they're actually relatively few compared to the macroscopic. So the macro is all the insects, the crustaceans, the mollusks, most of the invertebrates. And some of the invertebrates are down here, and then the megafauna, as we know, is the mammals and birds and fishes, is relatively few in species. So what people have done is, is draw a line. They break this into smaller size categories and draw a line and say that, well, this big gap in the micro here is all the undiscovered species. But you can't draw a straight line here because it has to be a curve. It has to come back to zero because if you have zero body size, you don't exist, um, unless you're an alien or something, maybe. I don't know. Um, so the question is really, where is the peak in number of species? And I would argue it's definitely in amongst the insects. Um, and if we do marine species only, we actually have a higher proportion of microscopic uh, marine species, perhaps because of the zooplankton and uh, phytoplankton, um, which I haven't tested, but I think that's the reason. So why would that be? Well, and if we look at the most widespread species, this gives us a hint. So the most widespread species are pelagic, and the reeds are pelagic and they're very small, so they can move around without any energetic effort. And you know, there's phytoplankton that can survive 100, hundreds of years in sediments and, and grow again once they're released in the sediments. So these little microscopic pelagic species are very hard to go extinct, even locally, and they can just drift. Um, and there's a word for it, um, expatriation. So they like expatriates, they talk. So they, these, these phytoplankton can drift around the world's oceans, and then they grow where the conditions are right. And bacteria seem to do the same. Um, and then, of course, you have the megafauna, which individuals can traverse the ocean. So they make up the most widespread species. And because they're the most widespread, they have the highest gene flow. And because they have the highest gene flow, they often, and they can be very abundant, and over time, they often have high genetic diversity, especially for the microscopic ones. So they have high genetic diversity, but low species diversity. Um, and there's a theory of this uh, which goes back over 100 years, and people don't remember old theories that much, maybe. Um, and it was called the Bass-Becking Bass Hypothesis. Um, Bass-Becking was a Dutch botanist. And, and he gave the original idea to somebody named Bergenich, who didn't publish, so we can't find his original description. But he said everything is everywhere, and the environment selects what lives where for the microbia. And some marine scientists have actually suggested maybe this is the case in the oceans, as most of the oceans as well, because you have very low endemicity in the oceans, and maybe we see species where the environment is suitable, and with climate change, they will just move around and adapt as they have over millions and millions of years, and all the ocean is one connected uh, area. So the, these microbia have high dispersal, high abundance, and low extinction rates. A second case is parasites, and the third will be deep sea. So um, I also believe that every, when you look at the literature, especially in the first surveys of hosts, you often find one parasite unique to individual hosts. Um, although Sometimes this is complicated because people define a new parasite and they name it after the host, assuming that every host has a unique parasite. So this exaggerates the, the, the parasite um, richness. Um, but if that was the case, there was even one parasite to every host, and you'd have half of all species should be parasites. But it's somewhere between 5 and 15, or maybe 20%, depending on how one defines parasites. And in this paper, <coughs> I looked at the parasites on land, so the top graph are the ticks and fleas. Um, <clears throat> actually, I don't think I include those interesting parasites in France. What are they that are going around France? No, okay. <laughs> no, well, these ones also suck blood, but on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. I, th I think I omitted that family here. So, uh, yeah, I did. So, so I haven't included all parasites, which is why my number is a little lower. But what I found, is, this is the number of species described per year, and I could, why aren't there more species being described? And the biting flies in recent years. So I contacted the experts for each of these groups, and they confirmed that these data are correct. Um, and they said it's very exciting now to find a new species of flea or tick or something, because 
Of course, they're very important for humans, and they're very important for farm animals. So actually, parasites on land are studied quite, quite a lot because of their pathogenicity issues. So we're getting a decreasing. So it means we would actually know definitely most of these parasites. So if we look at marine ones, um, I divide them into three groups. And I was kind of surprised that for crustaceans and mollusks, we're also getting this decreasing trend. So the um, black triangles, if I remind myself here, are the numbers of species per year. And only in the helminths are the black tri number of species per year still increasing. And like the previous examples, uh, most of these crustaceans and mollusks tend to be external parasites and larger, more visible, whereas the helmets are internal. So apart from the... And if we look at the uh, trends in authors in species per author per year, it's kind of the same for helminths, but it's decreasing crustaceans and mollusks. So this suggests we do know most marine parasites except for the helminth worms. Um, and then we read a bit more and you find out in agriculture people have been discovering, well, actually, parasites don't usually stick to one host. They have one host they're most abundant on because that's maybe the host they can get to most, but they often live on other hosts, and especially if you move um, hosts around different places and they introduce parasites, they'll often jump species. So parasites must be more flexible than sticking to one host. Um, and then the other problem is bias sampling. So if you only go sampling once, you often, you'll exaggerate parent host specificity, but more and more sampling, you find that actually they, they actually live in other hosts. Um, and then the other problem is these other microscopic things. So the other issue is that people often assume that the number of species must increase as genetic diversity increases. So that when you find a lot of genetic diversity in a species, then it must have lots of cryptic species that just haven't been separated yet. But that's not also, uh, that's not true either, because if you looked at multicellular islands of plants with very high numbers of species, relatively low genetic diversity per species, Whereas with viruses, you have huge genetic diversity, but relatively no numbers of viruses. And similarly for bacteria, there's only about 6,000 species of bacteria in it. So actually, the, the relationship may even be the reverse. It may be that species with high genetic diversity have high genetic diversity because they have very high gene flow, and this is their way of um, surviving in, in the world. Um, and that it's, it's these more complex eukaryotic animals that have lower genetic diversity. So, okay, so moving a little bit into the biogeography, if we look at the numbers of species, maps of species richness globally, the top map is species ranges from aquamaps overlaying each other, so the darker areas around the uh, Coral Triangle, Northern Australia, parts of the Caribbean, parts of the Mediterranean, um, have very high richness when you overlay these ranges, but it's, which is similar to if you look at the actual data in OBUS. Um, which is showing this more or less the same kind of pattern. So most species seem to be coastal um, and in the tropics. And if we look with depth, um, this is the data we've taken here. These are hexagonal cells which have enough data with depth to give some information. And of course, the total number of samples decreases with depth. This is on a log scale as well. Um, and the total number of species, as you'd expect with the number of samples, that also decreases with depth and the average number of species does. But if you standardize for species richness based on, by taking random 50 samples of records and how many species are in them, so you end up at an index called the ES50 here, um, you also see this rapid decrease with depth. And any study that really looks at large areas for species richness finds this pattern. In some areas, you may not find the pattern because there may be oxygen minimum zones or other factors that are interrupting this, this gradient. So there aren't more species with depth. But why might that be true, or is this still a sampling bias effect? Because people have discovered hydrothermal vents and other interesting habitats, um, and they're very excited. They find some extraordinary new species, but they're finding like tens of new species to science here, whereas when you look at where new species are being found, most of them are still found in coral reefs and shallow waters where hundreds and hundreds of species are being found per year. So. The reason for this is biogeography helps explain it, because the biogeography of the ocean changes with depth. So as you go deeper, um, species have larger depth ranges. So these are genera of sea pens. Um, and if you counted up the number of genera across here, you see most are shallow water and you get fewer as you get deeper. 
But the pattern I want to show is that the shallow water ones often have a very narrow depth range, whereas the deeper ones have a much deeper depth range. And that's because the ocean is getting more similar as you go with depth. And that has been mapped by um, Roger Sayer and colleagues at Esri, where they mapped the ocean into three-dimensional units based on temperature, salinity, oxygen, nitrate, phosphate, and silicate. Um, and if you do a cross-section of this, you find that most of these little ecological marine units, as they call them, are in shallow water. And as you go deeper, you end up with fewer and fewer of them. So if a species can live in, say, this large blue area on the right, then it can live over this huge depth range here, but it can't live in the shallow water, uh, and so on. So I think the biogeography helps explain the, the patterns of species richness with depth in the oceans. <coughs> and it also does so um, in coastal waters, because when we go back to the... Um, these maps here, um, these are model ranges based on environmental parameters. So they've taken into account depth and light, um, temperature, salinity, I think, um, and a few other variables. And, and all the, the, the species modeling uh, will find similar patterns. So we don't, they all predict lower species richness in the mid oceans and the deep oceans. <coughs> And this paper came out this year, which I think is really cool, because um, in the deepest part of the sea, below 4,000 meters, the combination of low temperature and pressure um, makes the environment undersaturated in terms of calcium. So anything, any calcium carbonate dissolves. And this paper has shown for the first time that actually this does affect the fauna and flora. So the, the two... Uh, sets of th these are different uh, phyla and classes of, of organisms they found in samples. Their samples are just from the North Pacific, so it's not a global study. Um, but you can see that the, the, the relative dis abundance of these different taxa varies above and below around 4,500 meters in the area. And this is because you're losing most of the calcified ones in the deeper water. No, sorry, yeah, these calcified ones in the deeper water. Um, so I can't, I've, I've list, I should have listed them on the slide, but sea pens, where's the mollusks? Mollus, mollusks down here. So the bivalves are more abundant above this carbon saturation horizon uh, than they are below it, where obviously shelled animals, their shells are dissolved so they can't function. Um, <coughs> so how big is this habitat? Well, in another paper we had uh, just coincidentally came out a week after that paper, and we did, I think we cited it just, just in the proof stage. Um, it's actually huge. So there's been a nice paper by um, a, a Sulpus et al., and then we took that paper with Peter Harris in Norway, and we mapped it globally for different oceans. So the blue is, um, red is the areas that have been increasing. The, so, the, so with increased carbon dioxide dissolving in the ocean, and people know about ocean acidification, but actually surface oceans will never become acidic, but it is actually a functionally acidic in these deep seas, so this is really acidic. Um, and these deep areas are slowly expanding as the carbon dioxide and the ocean currents bring that lower, uh, that increased carbon dioxide concentrations down at the deeper depths. So these dark blue areas are the areas that are already below the carbonate compensation depth, so they're undersaturated below it. So you can see it's a large area of the ocean. Um, and red is expanding, and with future warming, if it increases by another uh, a future climate change by another 300 meters, these areas will rapidly expand, but differently in different areas depending on the slope of the seabed. So if, if it suddenly hits the top of a plateau, then that will, will shoot across the top of the plateau. So there's actually a large part of the ocean is this um, calcium, in a way, limited habitat, which wasn't, hasn't ever been taken into account in biogeography before. And this, this depth is, is rising. So the average for the world is around, will be, could be about 4,200 meters. So below that, so that's between 4,000 and 11,000. So kind of be more than half, nearly half the ocean in the deep sea would be below this depth. But it'll vary between basins. Um, yeah, and this is just breaking it down per region to show that there are differences between regions and that it'll be up to around, whereas the total is up here, um, it could be around 15% of the global area, actually, around 20%. Yeah. 
Um, but there's another area of habitat that's also shrinking, and that's the amount of oxygen. So there's a paper some years ago looked at oxygen sensitivity across a whole range of marine species, benthic and planktonic, um, and it showed that below three milligrams per litre, most species um, suffer from oxygen deprivation and will, and will die. So if we use three milligrams per litre as the kind of hypoxic level, and you compare it between oceans, we can see that the Pacific Ocean, there's nearly 30% of the Pacific is already hypoxic, doesn't have enough oxygen for many species. Um, only the Arctic and the Southern Ocean have very high levels. But actually in the Arctic, there's another problem. Because it's so cold, species can't absorb oxygen easily. So species could still be oxygen limited due to the cold temperatures uh, in the Arctic. Um, so we, we're ending up now, and, and the number of oxic areas, which is the, the green line here, I think, greater than six milligrams per litre, it is temperature dependent, um, but the number of oxygenated areas as well. So the Pacific and Indian Ocean have very few areas that have ample oxygen for all species. And then you have this kind of level in the middle here where some species are more and less sensitive. Um, okay, so we've got those, we've got the ocean is shrinking in terms of oxygen and carbon saturation, uh, carbon dioxide saturation. Um, but let's look at latitudinal diversity gradients, which tell us something now about the temperature effects. Um, and I've already pointed out how biogeography helps explain species richness and, and in relation to gene flow and widespread taxa and, and so on. So that's my summary of species richness. So we'd expect lower species richness in those areas due to oxygen as well as um, uh, carbon, carbon dioxide saturation, but I haven't really quantified those yet. Maybe somebody else will do that someday. Um, but actually, of species in Earth, definitely not most are marine. There's about 15% are marine, and marines still aren't catching up with terrestrial, even though the rates of discovery might be higher. Um, there's around 10% are microscopic, and 15% are parasites, and most are in the coastal tropics. So I still uh, think that we'll have about 2 or 3 million species in Earth, of which about two-thirds are already named. And the Catalog of Life has na a list 2.2 million now. Um, of course, that still leaves hundreds of thousands, perhaps, more to be discovered. And as they're discovered, maybe they'll tidy up and get rid of some of the redundant names in, this, in the databases. So this is what I was told in university, and these are some of the things that I discovered were not true. So what really makes me wonder, then, is what I th I'm thinking now. There's probably some young person in the audience here is going to give a talk in five, ten years' time and show that some of these things I said are not true either because I was missing some data or some reason. So, um, and that's what history shows us, isn't it, in science, that a lot of things we think are true at one time are not true later. So looking at zoogeographic regions on land, these are very well established now through data analysis, but actually they were known for several hundred years. Uh, the early biogeographers pointed out these different regions. Um, and they pointed out Wallace's line here, which some people still infer. I was at a conference recently and people explained that, oh, the main species are different across Wallace's line. Um, I don't know where they thought that, but um, because when we reviewed the literature with, with uh, Tri Arfianti, um, she's a student in Indonesia, and um, she did some sampling, and the, these are the, the Wallace's line and so-called Ledeker's line. Um, and she couldn't find any evidence in her samples that there was any barriers across this region. And then we looked at literature, and in fact, all the papers that had data couldn't find any evidence for Wallace's line. So actually, all the, the coral triangle is all really within one biogeographic region. And her analysis, but also analyses on polychaetes globally and other groups, all show that this the, the Coral Triangle region is a part of one large biogeographic region that extends around the coast to Madagascar um, and around the coast of the Indian Ocean. So it's actually one region here. So in some ways, the ocean is definitely more connected than terrestrial systems. Um, and this was an analysis I did with 65,000 species of MOBUS. We did cluster analysis. Um, and we divided the ocean to these different regions. And I already know that the Brazilians have done an analysis with a lot more data here, and they've shown that there's a, a distinct couple of, couple of uh, biogeographic regions on their coast, which is not surprising. Um, and probably 
in time, people will redefine these boundaries because we don't know exactly why these boundaries are there. Is, it, is there some temperature gradient? Is there some depth gradient? And it does seem to be a, a temperature and depth gradient here, for example, but it, it remains closer scrutiny. So these are regions then based on endemicity. So if one wanted to protect or have marine protected areas, one should have some in all of these regions. Um, so that's what we did. We took species richness from aqua maps and we added it to these regions and we collected these species richness areas with endemicity subset. And then we used, we also classified ecosystems, which is another story, um, using environmental variables, a bit like the SAIR study, but with more variables um, and only shallow water. Um, we used those by geographic realms, as I mentioned, and species ranges. And we also included biomes, mangroves, coral, reefs, seagrass, and kelp. And we used seabed rugosity as an indicator of habitat variation where you didn't have these um, biomes. And if we t take the top 30% of the ocean that might be protected then for, as has been proposed by 2030, these are the areas. And about, um, I think 40% is in the high seas, even though the high seas make up 60%. So the high seas are still very important, these mid-ocean areas. Um, which is kind of reassuring because you might have thought from the richness plots I showed earlier that maybe we don't need to worry about the high seas and deep sea because there's relatively few species. But the species in those areas are unique, so they don't occur in coastal waters. So to include a representative sample of species, you need to include all the different habitats. As, as the Convention of Biological Diversity says, but countries seem to forget that little word, representative habitats, and just go for 30% of anything. Yeah. And we still see the coral triangle is pretty high. So how are they going to fix this? Are you going to protect? I don't think it's realistic to imagine that all this area will be fully protected with no fishing anymore. So the challenge going forward, of course, is how to manage this so that you protect species in some areas and you manage to not drive them to extinction in adjacent areas. Um, but moving into latitudinal gradients, um, Hani Saidi did her master's on razor clams in Iran, and she came to do her PhD, and she still wanted to work on razor clams. Um, she's moved on to the deep sea now as well. Um, but when she plotted the number of species of razor clams globally, um, she found this strange dr drop at the equator. So we thought that was a mistake, because all the literature says the number of species increases at the equator. And we even looked at some papers, and if they saw data points down here, they just said, oh, they're probably a mistake. So they just drew a line from this point to this point. Um, or they aggregated them over 10 degrees. But um, being the um, critical scientists we were, we said, well, no, this is correct. Because she went to museums, she checked the specimens, she went to Europe and America. And uh, the more she corrected it, she found that most razor clams were either in the northern or the southern hemisphere. Very few of them actually crossed the tropics. Um, so we call this a bimodal gradient with the two, p two modes here. And uh, much to her annoyance, um, she gave a talk at the Biogeography Conference. The editor of the journal said, great paper, we should submit it to our journal. She submitted it, a past peer review. And then at the very final stage, the editor said, but you have to leave this word bimodal out of the title and you can't discuss it in the conclusions because everybody knows it's not bimodal. We said, but that's the whole novelty of our paper is that it's bimodal. So we're... <clears throat> Being a bit stubborn, um, uh, we looked at then all species in Obus. And Chai was just starting her PhD, so we went through the literature. So we had a, a short paper in Trends in Ecology show that pretty much every study had a bimodal distribution, or you couldn't tell if it was bimodal or not because of the way they analyzed the data. And if you took, and also the way they presented the data, if people present just a number of species and samples, this is the pattern we get here with most species in the Northern Hemisphere due to sampling bias. Um, but if you take the total number of species per latitude, then you get this dip at the equator. And if you take uh, the ES50 index, which I mentioned before, you also get this dip at the equator and there's little error bars here as well. So, and then we realized, well, this is exactly what uh, uh, climate change scientists have been predicting, a decrease in species at the equator and a shift into higher latitudes. So we thought, well, it's actually not that surprising in hindsight. And once we published a paper in Trends in Ecology, we went back to the Journal of Biogeography and say, OK, we've shown that this is a general trend and this paper is an exception and they accept it. Chaya went on to do, um, look at the trends over time. In the paper, we showed three time periods, but I just showed two here for 
clarity. So before and after around 1985, because after around 1980s, warming was much more constant in all, all the world's oceans apart from some little place off Greenland. Um, and you can see that uh, red is before and blue is after. You see this increasing dip at the equator. So this is a, a GAM models fitted to the data to take into account sampling effort. Um, and you can see the increases in middle latitudes, so species are moving from the the equator into the middle latitudes, and an increase in the northern hemisphere, but not, not in the southern, as predicted. And it happens the same with benthic species, and even more so with pelagic species, we get a stronger signal. Despite the fact that there's less pelagic species, we get a, a stronger signal. So species are moving with latitude. But not all species are distributed the same with latitude. So razor clam showed one pattern, but if you look at, think of penguins and other groups, they're obviously either only northern or southern hemisphere, and so on. And I, this is a really nice study from the Reef Life Survey, um, where they've got samples in most of the world. They now will have some from Norway. But even the photographs tell the story. When you're in the tropics, um, this is my favorite place I ever visited, Rajarampat. You should, you should, Sizik should have its next uh, staff meeting there, I think. I would recommend that. Very nice hotels, too. Probably, you know, no more expensive than hotels here. Barcelona hotels are very expensive. Um, um, but you see all the fish here and the corals. So you don't see that much. The only benthic animals you actually see in these tropical reefs are grazing resistant. They're corals or some anemones with defensive fish around them. Whereas when you go to high latitudes where it's colder, you see this rich epifauna um, and, and the same in the southern latitudes. And then when we compare the data going from the equator, so combined northern and southern hemispheres, so it goes from zero degrees of the equator up northwards. So we get a decreasing rich of vertebrates, which is mostly fish, but also turtles. Um, and this is kind of well known that fish don't like very cold water, relatively few species do. Um, and it happens at richness and abundance. And invertebrates show the opposite trend. At a local scale, this is very hard to tell apart sometimes because you get local variation, but uh, on a latitudinal gradient. So then we realize, well, fish are the dominant grazers. There's no, almost no herbivorous fish above 20 degrees centigrade. So as you move, but in the tropics, um, you'll have lots of herbivorous fish. So they dominate grazing, they restrict plankton, then they're competing with invertebrates for that uh, primary production. So the invertebrates have a tough time in the tropics. And actually our paper on amphipods found relatively few amphipods on a sampling day in Indonesia. I would find more in Ireland if I went sampling in one or two hours, I'd find maybe 20 or 30 species. In Indonesia, they'd be lucky to find five or 10 at the same time. So I was kind of surprised by that. I thought my student wasn't, she wasn't doing her field work hard enough. <laughs> so she used different methods like light traps and so on. But you actually seem to get lower richness of some invertebrates in the tropics, probably due to fish predation on the invertebrates as well. So here's one of your, um, anybody know this guy? Yeah, yeah okay. This is Sesk. So, um, Seska joined me to do a PhD, and he looked at a database, and the Arctic is warming very fast up here, four times the global average. <coughs> and he analyzed data from the North Sea up to Svalbard and the Barents Sea. This is his study area. Um, and he had data going back several decades and almost 200 fish species. And this is what he found. So the amazing thing is that this graphed a number of fish species almost parallels so closely the temperature graph. In fact, I worry afterwards that it parallels it so closely that really what we're looking at is fish activity and not fish presence. Because the more active the fish are, the more you'll catch in the trolls. So maybe the fish are actually there all the time, but we never see the, them until the temperatures warm up enough for them to be active. Um, and especially in this region here, the, um, in the northernmost region, we see the biggest percentage change. So there's actually two times more species in the Arctic uh, seas now than in the 1980s. So this is amazing. And nobody shouts in the newspapers, this is great news. I don't know why. You know, all my career we were told species, more species richness is a good thing, and then when you get it, people are kind of quiet because it's due to climate change. Maybe, maybe, maybe this change will cause some bad things to happen that we don't know about yet. Um, sometimes maybe we just worry too much. Um, but there's actually other, other, other reasons I'll come to in a minute. Um, and if we look at the different species, we see that most are 
uh, moving northwards, they've got a positive correlation, and relatively few are decreasing or contracting their ranges. Um, and the same if you divide the fish communities in the North Sea, they're nearly all increasing, a few decrease in the Svalbard region and the Norwegian Barents Sea. So there are some species at higher latitudes that are losing their range as expected under, uh, under climate warming, some of these cold water species. But not all the case because some cold water species like the Greenland halibut is actually increasing its size. If we look at maximum body size, generally decreases with warmer temperatures within the species um, due to oxygen limitations. Um, but in this case, the Greenland halibut is actually getting bigger with warmer conditions. But what we, think, what we think will happen is that eventually we'll reach a peak of some optimal temperature and it'll decrease in body size. So most species get smaller uh, in warmer temperatures. Um, except, and, but of course, in the species living at like minus two to, to one degree, uh, a little bit of warmth would be very nice for them. They're very grateful for it. I'm sure. <clears throat> so it's not all a, it's such a simple story. And if we look at the time series, uh, this is amazing data from um, people who look at sediment cores. And there's actually people who have had their whole lives looking at microscopic things in sediments that they collect in deep sediment cores. And they've lots of these cores, and depending on the depth of the sediment, they can age it roughly. So this is last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. This is pre-industrial, and this is future predicted. Um, and we see the last glacial maximum, this is for planktonic foraminifera, was almost flat at the equator, and now it's decreasing and predicted to decrease more around the equator, the number of species will decrease. So the, actually, the ocean has been warming since the last glaciation, and species have been declining at the equator ever since then. Um, but the pace, as I've shown in the previous graphs, is increasing due to climate change. And if we take that data and we plot it against temperature and we, we fit, a, fit a, some um, segmented regressions to it, we find that the point where this changes is around 20 degrees, both for the last glacier maximum and the present data. So, okay, that's planktonic foraminifera, but is that a general pattern? Well, it turns out, using the same data in Chaya's paper on the latitudinal gradients, it is, because above 20 degrees over all marine species, it reaches, seems to have reached an asymptote, but for some groups like pelagic fish and benthic invertebrates, it decreases as it did for the foraminifera. For benthic fish, it still seems to increase to 26 degrees. And we can look at these patterns across all kinds of different groups, where each data point here is a latitudinal, um, uh, great, uh, the number of species per latitudinal band. I think red is uh, the southern and black is the northern hemisphere. And I think in some groups we see polychaetes, was it, or arthropods, we see different gradients in northern and southern hemispheres. So 20 degrees seems kind of significant for many of these groups. And even for the Reef Life Survey, where they looked, uh, they classified species based on their median preferred temperature into temperate and tropical fish and invertebrates on the right, um, into different gills. And these gills overlap around 20 degrees. So you end up getting peak of fish around 26, just like in that previous data, but completely different data sets, and invertebrates around tw at 20 and 26 for fish. So we do see, um, so to try and summarize these things before I finalize the talk on the 20 degrees issue, um, we can see that species are declining since the last glacial maximum and shifting their distributions, and that these tempers and sp these gills separate around 20 degrees. Um, and there's a reason why 20 degrees might be important, which I hadn't realized until I met a, somebody who works in energetics, energy, uh, ener temperature and energetics. And we all know that we see this graph of, it's kind of like a curve of life, um, where whatever variable you use, biological variable, things happen really slowly at cold temperatures. They speed up, they reach some, what we call an optimum, and then they rapidly decrease and the animal might die at the high temperature. So this is kind of a, interesting, it's asymmetric, the curve. Uh, which is important, and then you have this, what they call optimal. But is this really optimal? Because if you're living at the optimum, it's like you're right on the edge. If we just get a few days above that temperature, you may be dead, in which case you leave no descendants. Um, so it's better, really, to live a little bit below the optimum, um, where you have a little bit of latitude, I mean latitude, I mean flexibility, um, in how to, to, to manage your thermal performance. 
Um, there's another argument, if you're living at the optimum, then you need to have the maximum amount of food, everything else needs to be optimal as well as temperature, um, which is unlikely to be the case all the time. So all the laboratory experiments which are calling this the optimum, that's in laboratory conditions, but in the field your real optimal will have to be a bit less than that. Um, and this is a paper by Ross Corkery and his, his colleagues. He also published in the Journal of Astrobiology, and I just met somebody who wants to publish in astrobiology in their career because they like to be a space scientist. Um, <clears throat> so he calls this the temperature maximum enzyme stability. So he then looked across all domains of life, and he looked at individual species and see at what temperature each species finds is most stable, the most energetically efficient temperature. And a previous studies had shown in cell biology that actually 20 degrees is the most stable, but they always looked at only a few species here and there. So it could be just because of the species that people chose. But there was a literature review by Dell et al. and PNAS, and they reviewed a thousand species, and they found 19 and 21 degrees were optima for marine and freshwater species. And um, when you actually look at this, um, what they call the thermal stability range, you find this optimum temperature is around 20 degrees for bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. So it turns out it's not only the biochemically most efficient temperature, but it's the same across all domains of life. So this seems to be a really fundamental property of uh, life, and it's probably due to the properties of water, as actually suggested in some, some studies. Um, so if we look at um, oxygen, this is a paper by um, Acquer Senior and Carlos Duarte. Um, and if you divide their data set, they fit at a straight line to this, but I think it's fairly clear that it's a, it's a curved line. And you have, and I showed before, you have the oxygenated and the hypoxic layers here. So 20 degrees is sort of, a, a well, the same, the point here where above 20 degrees, oxygen becomes limiting for most species. And in fact, if you go above 30 degrees, oxygen is, becomes limiting for virtually all species except bacteria and cnidarians. So we did our own literature survey. Um, a bit like Dell et al's. We got the thermal ranges, so each of the little bars here are thermal ranges for all data. These are Ross's uh, models, and these are for the results of the data. We still find that 20 degrees overlaps, and when you add all these together, the individual species, you end up at this peak around 20 degrees here. A bit annoyingly, it's a little bit more like 22, so okay, maybe it's not perfectly 20, but it's close. Um, and we find lots of things decline above 20 degrees. I don't have an idea of the time, so I don't know how I'm doing time. Am I over time? No? Yeah. Okay, I'm just in the last few slides. Um, so I'll just let you read this, but basically, um, if you look at ecological function indicators like productivity, uh, as well as species richness that I showed you earlier, and, and just in the last few years, there have been a couple of nice papers looking at predation pressure, um, and they find in pelagic and benthic species, predation pressure is highest at 20 degrees. So that could be because you have both temperate fish and tropical fish overlapping, and the temperate fish are really hungry because it's 20 degrees, and they normally would prefer it to be a little bit cooler, and they're competing with the tropical fish. Um, so that's where all, all the life is happening. So, that, so I think that, that those drivers of, of then species selection increase from 20 degrees onwards. This is why you get more species at a local scale in the tropics than in the temperate regions, because everything is competing, because they're now all competing at 20 degrees plus, so they really have to get enough food somehow to survive, and that's how they form separate species. So this is, I think, my second last slide. So in this paper, which is coming out in the Frontiers in Biogeography, which has nothing to do with those other Frontiers journals, it's the Journal of the Biogeographical Society. Um, we think 20 degrees, well, biochemically, they've already shown it's the most stable and efficient temperature for protein synthesis. But we also find that most species like to live at 20 degrees, and it's probably where most species competition and predation occurs. And beyond 20 degrees, actually, primary production starts to decrease um, because those primary producers, their respiration rates are much higher at, uh, above 20 degrees, so that, and, and photosynthesis uh, declines. Um, and then you have relatively few species that are adapted to live at these very high temperatures and very low temperatures. Okay, so finally, um, so what, what about extinction rates? So some of the early estimates, that I think even yesterday was another article out about on plants saying that most plants are threatened with extinction. Um, 
In fact, relatively few plants have gone extinct compared to vertebrates, but that's another story. Um, so there's about 2 million species named. There's about 150,000, I think around 160,000 now assessed in the, in the world red list. So they're not really making a lot of progress doing the business as usual with expert opinion. Um, and there's around 1,000 species extinct. There's only 18 of those marine, which is kind of good news. We haven't had some major impact yet. And of those 18, mostly they were due to human hunting and deliberate targeting. Um, but of climate change, you would think um, if you read the IPCC report, which I was an author on, the terrestrial chapter mentions extinction constantly. It's almost in every line. And so I said, well, where's all, what's, what went extinct? So I started searching. There's only two species have gone extinct, possibly due to climate change. So you have this huge narrative that climate change is the biggest problem affecting human society, which is true, but it's actually not such a problem. It's not because of the impact it's going to have on biodiversity, really, because the present threats to biodiversity, we already well know. They're like hunting, overfishing, habitat loss, and these uh, and, and rivers, it's pollution as well, and invasive species. So we already know all these reasons of, of uh, predation, and it's almost like climate change is a, a distraction. Let's worry about climate change, which we can't fix anyway, at least for biodiversity. Um, but actually only two species have gone extinct. One was a frog in Costa Rica, lived on top of a mountain, they had a few very dry years. I'm kind of hoping it'll be refound again because frogs sometimes disappear and they're found again. Um, and the other was a marsupial mouse in of Australia, which the, was living on a very small island, and the island got flooded during a big storm. Um, but it probably was a subspecies. There's lots of these little marsupial mice on islands around Australia. So I, th I think it's it's kind of remarkable. So what, what actually the people are talking about with extinction is they're confusing global extinction with local extinctions. So when species move their ranges, they're talking about, oh, the species went extinct in Barcelona, but maybe it moved north up to somewhere else or you know, to another location. Um, and they're, mix they're mixing up these concepts. And then in the public mind, of course, this creates a sort of a alarm um, as well. But we do have shrinking livable habitat for life on Earth. So the question is then, how much of a range does a species need to survive? I don't think we have any idea of, of that for most marine species. There's a little snail lives in Malta, which is endemic only to one harbor, I think, in Malta. Um, I've forgotten its name. Uh, and it, they thought it was extinct, and then they found it again in a harbor where it shouldn't be because the harbor is polluted. <laughs> um, and, and then you have other species that are they're, they're suitable habitat is shrinking in the Arctic. But uh, maybe this happened before. Maybe this happened about uh, 6,000 or so years ago. They had the, what, the climatic optimum, whereas apparently the Arctic was ice-free uh, since the last glaciation, um, and then it got cooler again. So maybe all the marine species we have around the North Arctic and uh, North Atlantic and Pacific, real, they've already survived similar events that they will experience this century. But then there's all the other human impacts that are happening that didn't happen before. So thank you very much. I'd like to conclude on that. I'm, not, I'm accused of being an optimist, so I didn't want to be too pessimistic in, in projections. Thank you. Well, thanks for the talk. Um, I, I was wondering about these decrease in the, in the um, equatorial areas and, and thinking, talking specifically, specifically about marine sites, whether there's been a, whether, is there any evidence of a decrease in the equatorial upwelling strength in the, in the recent years? I don't know. I haven't looked at the upwellings. Um, because, the, I mean, th that's a supply mm. of energy that maybe it's decreasing or it's changing or something like that. I mean, and not compensating, not compensating the increase in temperature or something like that. Yeah, because there's a very important, especially in the Pacific, where you've got that upwelling creates yeah. a cool current that runs back across the equator. But it, it goes also in the, in, in the Atlantic too. So Atlantic right. and Pacific, it's... it's yeah, that I have no idea. And then it will be warmer. That may be true. You should look into that. <laughs> <laughs> Another good reason somebody told me was, uh, which sounds plausible, was that highest rainfall is around the equator. So if you get increased rainfall, maybe this has some effect. But 
the mechanism was a bit unclear. Yeah. Any additional question? Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, uh, regarding the, the number of species in microbes in the microbial part of the of the spectra, uh, I think it, there are problems which are very severe in this part, which is the morphology counts very little for microbes. Uh, many, thing, many things are based on getting cultures, which is also very complicated. So I think the name, the number of species which are named, is not useful for the. Um, to detect how many species are there in this size fraction, the number of the species which are named. So probably it's much more useful to look at the genetic markers, and it's again true that with the genetic markers there is a discrep discrepancy, which, so it's not very clear how many species are there. Uh, I agree with the fact that um, being very small they are much more distributed, so there is less endemicity probably, but still I'm not convinced that the number of species is lower in this part. So this cross that you show, uh, I think yeah. it has to be validated by molecular markers, basically. But uh, you can't really do it by molecular analysis alone. Well, if you do whole genomes, maybe? Well, I think, the, at least for the eukaryotes, probably the ribosomal gene is a quite useful marker, and it has been a lot of work on that. At the end, the problem, what I would see, is that there are many sequences which are unique, mm. which have a lot of, uh, they, they may be erroneous. So I think there is a lot of work to do there. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think we've only just begun to understand genetic diversity and what these genes mean. And I think it's a lot of very simplistic thinking, thinking went into, you know, well, if every new gene variant means a new species, that's too simplistic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think that uh, it, it's the concept itself on a species is what fails there. Yeah. So we are not able to compare something that compares to the species in, in, in larger carrots. I think that that's, yeah. that's the problem. So that's the problem. I'm, I'm just using the taxonomic concept. Yeah. This is what we've named species so far, yeah. and based on this methodology, this is what the predictions are. But of course, if we change what we mean by a species, it could be anything. Yeah. I think I have a question as well. You touched on something that here we hear a lot, that we are losing the taxonomist, and that we won't be able to identify the things that, that, that we have anymore mm. because of this, this uh, yeah, discipline is being lost. But you mentioned otherwise, right? You argued yeah. otherwise. Can you expand a little bit more on that? And, and what is the new, the new role of these new technologies that we all know that have problems that may also have potential solutions to describe a species? Yeah. Well, there's been several surveys of taxonomists in Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, um, and they define a taxonomist, taxonomist much more broadly than I have. They would include people who don't describe new species but just identify species, and people who do phylogenetics because they separate species based on uh, genetic indications. Um, so, and I haven't covered those, but I've taken a very small, strict definition of people who have described new species. Um, and we know where they are. Their names are in the database. Most of them are still alive. And uh, we know where they live from their papers. And this has been found again and again in different studies. So it's simply not true that uh, taxons are just increasing. But of course, in people's minds, the oldest and best known person is retiring, just like in music and uh, other fields of, of, you know, where the people that are best known are often at the end of their careers because they've been publishing for decades. And they don't know the younger ones. And in the World Register, in Species, they did a survey. And, and found that actually it wasn't true either, even within their editorial board. And the editorial board has been selected by people who are already usually well established in the career. So that doesn't take into account postdocs, usually very few postdocs probably on the editorial board. Um, yeah, so it's one of these myths that just keeps happening, keeps coming back, and people believe it without looking at the data. It's terrible to have databases that collect data, and you actually look at the data and you find that. What people have been thinking has been wrong. Uh, when I gave this, um, when a friend of mine from South Africa came up and he said, how could we keep saying this without ever actually checking the numbers? <laughs> so he was right. I said, yeah, I know. it's strange that we, we sometimes are so convinced in our beliefs and we, everybody agrees with us that we don't bother checking to see if it's really true. Very exciting then when you find out, okay, we were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And that gives us a positive <coughs> message to the new generation. No, this is a field yeah. that is increasing, and there's actually a lot of work to do, a lot of crosses or checks to 
to falsify yeah. or to verify. So and, and tools like uh, iNaturalist app, which um, it's amazing if you use iNaturalist, the people that can help identify species just from pictures alone is amazing. But of course, they're all over the world now, and so you have people correcting things within. So if I, if I put in a plant into iNaturalist, somebody will correct it the same day or the next day or, or confirm it's correct. So I, th I think there's a lot more citizen sciences as well. And, and I mean, traditionally, there's no reason, there's no education needed to be able to identify species except self-education and learning what the species are. So there's many very good, and birds, of course, especially, there's many excellent citizens identifying species. Yeah. But also in plants. Thank you. Yeah. Any final question? Otherwise, we'll uh, thank you very yeah. much. We'll, uh, yeah, I, th I think to finish your question, probably what we need to do in the marine area is to make marine images of species and information more available online to help citizens wanting to identify species be able to do it better. The World Register of Marine Species is not designed for this, and neither any of the other platforms. So if you find a you know, polychaete somewhere, you really still have to contact the experts to try and figure out what it is if it's a bit unusual, whereas more, more data online freely will, will help. Yeah. Thanks. Nice. Thank you, Mar, very much.